In 2001, beneath a crushing weight of the largest moving object on Earth, three divers ventured into unexplored territory. What they found wasn't just a cave system, it was a warning from nature itself. This is the story of the B-15 iceberg dive, where the line between pioneering, exploration and survival became terrifyingly thin. Joe Hynerth grew up in Toronto, Canada during the golden age of exploration. As a child of the 1960s, she watched the Apollo missions pierce through the boundaries of human achievement, while Jacques Cousteau's underwater adventures filled her with imagination every Sunday night. When her mother told her that Canada didn't have a space program, Joe turned her eyes from the stars to the depths below. By 2001, she had become one of the world's most accomplished cave divers, but Antarctica would test her limits in ways that no limestone stone cave ever had. Tiny, tiny leak in my glove. The plan began when she and filmmaker Wes Skiles watched satellite imaginary of a massive crack forming in the Ross Ice Shelf, a floating glacier the size of France. When a piece the size of Jamaica broke free, they saw their opportunity. We pitched it to National Geographic, Hyneth recalls. They asked if there were caves inside icebergs, and we said, hell yeah. But the truth was, we didn't know. It was simply a hypothesis. The B-15 iceberg was unexpected. 4,200 square miles of ancient ice. Now the largest moving object on Earth. Heiner theorized that, just as water carves limestone caves over time, the same process might create caverns within the ice. But unlike limestone caves, these would be ever-changing, moving, and potentially lethal. The journey began with a 12-day sail from New Zealand through some of the world's most treacherous waters. 60-foot waves battered in their research vessel before the B-15 finally appeared on the horizon. A wall of pristine ice rising thousands of feet from the ocean, like a floating mountain range. Hynath's team included her husband, Paul, an expert diver, and Wes Skiles, a renowned underwater cinematographer. Both men were accomplished cave explorers, but neither had experience in ice diving. In waters just fractions of a degree above freezing, this inexperience would prove nearly fatal. Their first dive almost ended in a disaster. Moments after entering the water, Skyo's suit flooded with near freezing water. Instead of surfacing immediately, he insisted on testing his camera. One minute in these waters is dangerous, Hyneth explains. You very quickly can lose the ability to manipulate your hands, to operate equipment, even to think straight. By the time they pulled Skyo's from the water, multiple crew members were needed to haul him aboard. They rushed him back to the main ship, stripped him down, and buried him in sleeping bags to prevent hypothermia. It was a stark reminder that in Antarctica, the simplest mistake could be lethal. But Hynerth and Paul decided to continue. They descended through the slurry of ice chunks and mixing waters, following a massive crevasse down to 130 feet. What they found exceeded their wildest theories. Above them, deep blue and white ice formed cathedral-like arches. Below, the seafloor erupted in a carpet of red, yellow, and orange filter feeding organisms. The contrast was stunning. Hynath would later write, like nothing we'd ever seen in any cave system on Earth. Then the horror really began. Spider-like isopods, each the size of a human hand, began raining down the cracks in the ice ceiling. They landed on cameras, shoulders, and even equipment. An alien welcome committee in this unexplored realm. But then the true danger revealed itself through the sound. The ice groaned and popped around them, a constant reminder that, unlike stable limestone caves, this environment was alive and moving. A deep vibration suddenly pulsed through the water, so powerful that Hyena felt it in her bones. When they turned to exit, their worst fears materialized. The entrance was blocked by massive chunks of ice. The sound they'd felt was the only way out collapsing. In their freezing darkness, with limited air supplies, they faced the cave diver's ultimate nightmare, a blocked exit in an unstable environment. Dawn broke over the Antarctic waters as Hynath and Paul prepared for their second descent. The previous day's near-death experience should have deterred them, but cave divers possess a unique psychology. Where others see danger, they see valuable intelligence gathered. Every close call provides data for the next attempt. The morning air was biting at their exposed faces as they checked their equipment. Double and triple checks became ritual. Regulations, tanks, backup systems, safety lines. At these temperatures, equipment failed failure wasn't just an inconvenience, it was a death sentence. Their support vessel, Braveheart, bobbed gently into the growing light. 
dwarfed by B-15's towering walls of ancient ice, they entered the water through the same opening as before. The initial shock of near freezing water felt like thousands of needles piercing in their exposed skin. Even through their dry suits, the cold crept in slowly and persistently like a patient predator. The descent through the crevasse was familiar now, 130 feet down through crystalline blue walls that seemed to glow from within. At the bottom, the cave entrance beckoned. Their powerful lights illuminated the stunning contrast between the pure white ice above and the riot of colorful life below. Filter feeding organisms swayed in gentle currents, creating a living carpet of crimson and gold against the turquoise ice. It was a photographer's paradise and they began documenting this alien world. Then Hyneth noticed the first warning sign, a subtle movement in the water. Within minutes, the gentle current transformed into something malevolent. The meltwater above had found its path, creating an underwater river that grew stronger with each passing second. Their bubbles, instead of rising straight up, now streamed sideways into the darkness of the cave. The change happened so quickly that there was no time for discussion. Hynet plunged her hand into the seafloor sediment, trying to anchor herself against the rush. The force of the water spanned her body like a flying in a hurricane, her fingers clutching desperately at the soft bottom. Paul, a few feet away, branched himself against the ice wall. Their lights illuminated particles rushing past them, an underwater snowstorm flowing into the berg's heart. They turned around the exit, but their powerful kicks achieved nothing. The current, now a raging torrent, held them in place. Each flutter kick consumed precious energy and air, with zero progress. Through the crystalline water, they spotted a faint blue glow in the distance. Another opening, but impossibly far away. Minutes spent deliberately meant minutes less air, with their original exit unreachable. They made the kind of choice that separates experienced cave divers from the dead. They stopped fighting the current. Instead, they let it take them, gambling their lives on that distant blue light. They were pulled through passages and chambers, their lights revealing glimpses of ice formations never seen by human eyes. The blue glow seemed to taunt them, never growing larger, as if they were swimming in place, while the ice tunnel stretched endlessly before them. But when they finally emerged, it wasn't into safety, but into a new kind of terror. They surfaced in a maze of ice, surrounded by walls too high to see over. Braveheart was nowhere in sight. The wind carried away their shouts for help. Their core temperatures were dropping. The water around them was starting to freeze, with ice crystals forming on their regulators. Their salvation came through pure chance. The same current that had nearly killed them had torn their ship's anchor loose. As the crew reset it, the sound of chains against metal echoed through the ice field. Through a momentary gap between ice flows, Hyneth caught a glimpse of the vessel's black hull. Their shouts finally carried to the crew, who skillfully maneuvered through the ice to retrieve them. But it was their third dive that would push human endurance to its absolute limit. This time, West Skyos joined them, determined to capture the underwater cave system with their best camera equipment. The extra gear would prove nearly fatal. They descended into a changed environment. The previous day's relatively stable ice cave had transformed. New cracks spiderwebbed across the ceiling. The current, when it came, was even stronger than before. It hit them like an underwater avalanche, pinning them against the cave floor. Skyos, weighted down by his camera equipment, began losing ground immediately. His call for help with the camera equipment crackled through their underwater communication system. Hynerth in the lead felt a surge of rage when Paul dropped back to assist. Extra seconds spent saving equipment meant less air for the ascent. Even after they managed to reach the crevasse, they faced what seemed impossible, a 130-foot vertical ascent against the current so strong that it threatened to tear away their masks. That's when Hynerth remembered the ice fish, tiny creatures that created burrow holes and the walls. These thumb-sized holes became their lifeline, natural climbing holds in the otherwise smooth ice. The ascent was excruciating. One hole at a time, they pulled themselves upward, their arms burned with fatigue, their fingers numbed by the freezing water. A small leak in Hynerth's glove had allowed the killing cold to creep in, turning her hand gray and useless. Three hours after entering the water, they finally surfaced. Their body pushed at the absolute limit of human endurance, yet incredibly they weren't finished. As they sat in the ship's warm cabin, planning one final dive, nature intervented. The screams from deck brought them running. They watched their dive
dive site tear itself apart, the section of B-15 they'd been exploring was breaking up. Massive chunks of millennium-old ice collapsing into the sea. Waves from the disintegrating berg rocked their ship. Had they been in the water, there would have been no hope of survival. The caves they explored that day no longer exist. That section of B-15 has long since merged with the Southern Ocean, but the footage they captured, and more importantly, the boundaries they pushed, remain. Their expedition wasn't just about exploration, it was about documenting Earth's changing systems, about pushing human limits in one of the planet's most hostile environments. Today, as climate change accelerates the melting of Earth's ice sheets, these ephemeral caves serve as both warning and testament. They remind us of our planet's fragility and power, of human courage and nature's might. Somewhat beneath the Antarctic ice, new caves are forming, waiting to tell their stories. But as Hyneth and her team discovered, sometimes the price of pioneering exploration is nearly paying with your life.